kind of a pastor am I? I almost skipped offering. That is really messed up. You can tell how money grubbing I am. It's fun seeing those children. And thank you, school. Thank you for all you do for them. Well, we don't have a children's story today, but my sermon does, all right? So we'll go to the table and let a child lead us. This sermon is entitled, Why Church? Communion's Answer. And I admit that when I was working on it, I had all kinds of thoughts of the body of Christ, the corporate nature. But I think right now what's needed most is a call back to church. And this table is one of those calls. So we'll focus on that with the understanding that while this table is many things, mostly it is our family table. And it's a beautiful table and beautiful family to be part of. Let's pray. Our Father God, we approach this table humbly because Jesus does that to us. We recognize the cost to a degree of what these emblems mean. But Jesus, we will learn more throughout eternity. You died because your children were lost. You died so you could gather us again. So gather us today around this table. If there are those who are hearing me by way of technology, by the next meal, may it be in person. I pray this in Jesus' name for all our sakes. Amen. We enter the upper room by Luke chapter 22 today, reading from the New King James Version. When the hour had come, by the way, those of you who read through the Gospels plenty, you know how often Jesus says, my time has not yet come. My time has not yet come. Even when they try to kill him, his time had not yet come. And now he says, the hour has. He said to them, with fervent desire, I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it. Gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Coming to the table, this table is probably what we all need most. What I know from a life of church is that the Sabbaths of this table usually have the least attendance. We avoid it. We avoid what we need most. When I was a little boy, now you have to, admit, have to imagine, preschool age, they didn't have us go to school in preschool back in the dark ages. We just had to hit school running. So before elementary school, probably five, I was about to do something on a whim, an idea that I should have left alone. I was staying with my great-grandparents. My dad's side, huge Vikings, Norwegians. My mom's side, tiny French people. My great-grandparents, my mom and papa, raised my mom from the time she was three weeks old, left on their doorstep. And it was the greatest gift God could have given her. Because my great grandma was one of the most spiritual women I've ever known. And to this day, one of the most meaningful people in my life. Probably four foot eight or so, I passed her up about five. I remember that day, 
Way upstate New York, just a few miles from the border of Canada, the Adirondack Mountains, Lake Chattagay. I had this idea that I should have left alone. I remember it was a beautiful morning, and um, in the mountains, they had these things of uh, hanging out laundry after you washed it. Um, in the winter, for after eventually they got dryers, even in my day, and they used those. But they actually had where you put the wet clothes into this thing that squeeze it, and you don't get your hands caught, or you're gonna be very flat by the time you get to the other side. And then we would put it all in a laundry basket, and I would help her, and we would go out to the, the lines of, to hang the laundry, and can you believe this? I couldn't reach those lines at this point in life. Later on, I towered above them because my little grandma could reach them. She put them on the lines, and then it was time to go back to the house. And with my boyish energy of five, I challenged her to a race. <laughs> we like to do that to old people. Now it will happen to me. It was no challenge racing my great grandma up the hill, her with the empty basket, me with five-year-old energy. And I remember I got to the screen door of the porch and I got inside and I was letting her know that I had won the race, which she could have cared less about. She was just trying to make it home. <laughs> Where I got this idea because um, on the screen door, I saw the lock. I, uh, modern children will not know about this stuff, but when I was a kid, they had these locks that were just so secure for a screen. A little eyelet in a, a hook of amazing power. <laughs> Just, you're safe if you have that little hook in there. I saw this and I had this thought, wouldn't it be fun to lock great grandma out of the house? <laughs> and so as she was coming toward me, um, I, I looked at her and I said, grandma, <laughs> mima. And she looked at the screen door and I, was, I started to I, this must have been from my dad's side of the family, this streak of sin. I, I was doing the hook like this, <laughs> letting her know her doom. <laughs> and she said, Ronnie, don't even think about it. It was too late. I'd been already thinking about it. And now she started to hurry toward the door, which didn't give me a lot of time to consider really what I was doing which if I had thought about it longer, maybe I would have been converted. But as she got near the door, I panicked. And I put the hook in the eyelet and locked the door. And she said, Ronnie, open that door. And I panicked. And I started to run. And she said, get back here and unlock this door. And, and I said something that I didn't even remember in my panic, but all the adults for years later always loved this story would remember. Don't panicky, Grandma, don't panicky. When I was the one panicky in, I ran deeper into the house as she was calling for me. I ran as far away in the house as I could get up the stairs. I wasn't thinking clearly because I ran and hid in the room of doom. Of all places, the scariest room in the house where my family would stay when we were all together there, the room with the pictures of the family in the 1800s. And for a five-year-old, 1800 pictures are the scariest thing to look at. Those people never smiled. I didn't know it was because it took so long to take a picture and they had to keep their faces straight. But they just looked so stern and mean. And, and for my imagination now at this point, it looked like their eyes were following me. I wanted to get out of the room, but I was too far in. I panicked and I ran and I slid under a bed, the wooden floor, the dust and lint, trying not to sneeze, listening to my great grandma down there banging on that, calling out, Ronnie, let me in. William, that's where I really, I was hearing the first names of my, my great grandparents. He was down in the root cellar. He was hard of hearing. He wasn't going, but I was afraid she, even little granny was gonna break that door open. And when she did, I knew I was dead. I waited there and I'm listening because where I am is just up above that porch and I could hear her smacking on that door calling, William, William, let me in. And a little bit later, my great grandpa came up out of the root cellar and he heard her and he's going, Emma, Emma, is that you? <laughs> and I thought, I'm dead. 
he went to the door and I could tell he had let her in. I waited for my death. I, I was in agony under that bed. I, I wanted to get out of the room, but every time I slid to the edge, I'd look up and I'd see those pictures and I'd go right back in. I, I listened because the creaky stairs, I was small enough that they didn't creak, but adults, you could hear them coming up the stairs, but no creaking stairs. I lay under that bed for two hours <laughs> in misery. I could smell, this was before COVID, long haul COVID, where I could actually smell and taste things. I could smell with my young nose, food being cooked, and I wanted to go to lunch so bad. Eventually, a man has to do what a five-year-old man has to do. I decided I'm getting out of here. I'm not looking at the pictures. I'm going to look down and run, and that's what I did. And I got out, and I listened at the top of the stairs, and I could hear them in the kitchen at the table. I snuck down the stairs as quietly as a five-year-old can, which is pretty quiet. I got down to the living room and then there was a door that went out into the kitchen and I could hear them at the table. And I snuck so quietly, as quiet as a mouse, to that doorway. And I don't know why, but God has given women a gift. Who needs radar? Who needs sonar? Who needs satellites? All you need is a mom or a great grandma. I didn't hardly move or hardly breathe. I just peeked around the corner. She wasn't even looking at me. And she said, Ronnie? <laughs> I almost ran again. But she said, Ronnie, would you like something to eat? In a smaller than my five-year-old voice, I said, yes. Then come sit down, still not looking at me, and eat. There's a place set for you. And I looked, and there was a place set for me, the sinner. <laughs> but it was right beside great grandma. <laughs> and I didn't want lunch to be my last supper. I made steps of halting faith as far away, thinking I'm faster than a grandma can reach, try to stay out of her little arms reach. But I went around and I knew that if I sat down, I'd be within reach. And it took me a while to actually sit in the chair. But I remember to this day that when I sat in the chair, not knowing what to expect, I saw my great grandma's eyes twinkling sparkling, and then she and great-grandpa broke out laughing, and I knew that I would live to see another day because they were laughing. Glorious, glorious laughter. Today we come to a table And all of us have done the wrong things. And some of us have run and hidden. Some right on out of the house. Some as far deep into it as possible. Trying to put distance between us, the one that loves us. Sometimes it can be scary I've prayed with plenty of those who are in those scary rooms. Sometimes it can be lonely, even in the house. Sometimes, kids, it can be boring. But after a while, all of us find that we are hungry really hungry and know where we've gone and nothing we've tried apart from him fills that hunger.
you're hungry, and you actually find that you miss your family. Most of all, though, in your heart, you know, you're not where you're supposed to be. And you're not about what you're supposed to be about. And you were meant to have and be more. And in that room farthest from grandparents, our father, heavenly father, our older brother, Jesus, you think to yourself, I don't deserve it. Or you think to yourself, I can't go back to him. I can't get close. I can't bear the look that will be in his angry eyes. I can't take hearing that rebuke. I can't bear the punishment he's going to give me. But he calls to you and he says, it's meal time. It's like my great grandma did. But if by faith you step forward, you find that his eyes sparkle. And when you sit down to the family table, you find that he laughs. I know it's going to really make a lot of Christians angry in heaven when they find that Jesus actually laughs. Heavenly laughter. It tells you that he loves you. It tells you you're forgiven. And you realize that all those words he'd said before, you realize they weren't just words, that his heart is really for you and that he really does love you and, and that he created this meal for you, for us. And that you know there is a place at the table for you. And that you belong here. There's a place at the heavenly table of the family of God that only you can fill. A place set specifically for you. And if you do not come to the meal, your chair at the table of the family will be empty and God's heart will ache. But not only his, your family, that is us. We miss you too. But if you come, you finally understand something about it. Not everything about it, because the table's too big, too deep, too high for us, but you learn something about it. It's hard to get your mind around all of it, but you start to realize that the one you locked out, the one you played games with, ran from, hid from, wants you for reasons that you don't even know. Not to punish, not to reprimand, not to give you the spanking you deserve, but to give you from his table freely, a table of grace. This is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed. The table was a cross but in heaven, it'll be our eternal heavenly family table, a place that Jesus has made for you. Why church? Well, we'll go through a lot of that the weeks to come, but because first of all, you'd be a fool to pass up what Jesus, our Lord and Savior has done for us by preparing this meal. Why church? Well, because his love not only created it, his heart deserves it. You, the family all around. The wiser we get, the more we know how beautiful it is to be at a family table. The more we understand life, the more we realize that being with our family is what matters so much. Maybe you've been hiding in the house, but you know that you are not in touch, not really connected with him. You're doing your choice. 
Maybe you stay close like I did that day at the top of the stairs, listening from a distance for just such a chance as this, listening, wondering, wanting to believe, just not willing to take those steps to come around the corner, to come out of your useless hiding. Well, today, this table is a reminder, this is the time and here's our chance. This is a golden opportunity. The one that loves you most and loves you best. The one you and I have locked out at times has prepared this table for us. And what does it mean? Well, it means that he's dying to have you back, seated at the table with him, to have you back home again, to eat, drink, laugh, and love together, to come back to the family table where stories of the past are remembered with joy, where in the present all is forgiven and forgotten, and where promises are made about an eternal future together. Promises from God himself that we will all be around this table again for truly the best agape feast ever, probably near the sea of glass. Why church? Well, because Jesus created it. His death means he wants you to be a part of it. This meal proves it. And his cross drives home the point. So today, those of us who are here, let us gather around the family table. Remember not only what he did, but who that makes us. Not just individually, but together. Our Father God, when you gave your only begotten Son, you knew more what it meant than we know even now. And Jesus, when you came, you knew exactly what the cup was. So I thank you, Jesus, for taking our cup and offering us yours. There are many, too many seats around your table, Lord, that are empty. I pray that more of your family will come home. Not that it's a building, but it's family that worships, that learns, that encourages, that walks each other home to heaven. May this be a beginning of a better taste of a future and eternal glory that begins now in Jesus' name. Amen. I would like to invite the elders who are helping me with the emblems and the deacons to come forward at this time. 